Well, good afternoon, everybody. The H1B Guy here, and today, the H1B Guy Live, August 4th, 2021, covering H1B survey results, a conversation on the impact of the travel ban, and Q&A. But before we get started, I'd like to ask you, if you haven't already, to please subscribe to the H1B Guy channel here on YouTube and like this video so that I can continue to produce more content like this for you. I also wanted to mention the H1B Guy offers a variety of consulting services. I help businesses and individuals solve complex work authorization issues in the recruitment process while bringing awareness to employment-based immigration benefits. If I can help you, please reach out. I'd love to hear how. Today's live stream is brought to you by RecruiterNetworks.com the smart solution for digital perm ads and local job postings since 2001. By Path to Canada, the ideal plan B for high-skilled immigrants currently located in the U.S. whose status may be uncertain. And also by perm-ads.com, the industry leader in providing a seamless experience for employers and immigration attorneys navigating the complex perm recruitment ad phase of the labor certification process. Well, wanted to uh, just thank everyone for joining me here again uh, this week. Did a live stream last Wednesday uh, covering, you know, the second H-1B lottery um, and some look ahead around the visa bulletin. And that video definitely got a lot of interest because that was on July 28th. Uh, later that evening afternoon, USCIS held their second H-1B lottery. Uh, and then begin notifying uh, employers and their attorneys starting on Thursday, July 29th, and um, continue to do so throughout the rest of the day. You know, I, I had mentioned that if you haven't heard anything by July 30th, uh, end of day last Friday, uh, that you were most likely not selected. I've, I've still gotten some questions around the second H-1B lottery, and if there's still a possibility um, for those if they haven't been notified, uh, right now, as it stands here on uh, August 4th, 2021, um, I'd say if your employer has not received notification, uh, if in your My USCIS, the, the, that account, if, if the updates haven't changed there, then unfortunately, you, you were most likely not selected. Um, there's still always a, a possibility, uh, but with that being said, it's, it's probably a no. Um, so thanks to everyone who's who's reached out to me and um, you know asked me the questions. Of course, you know if you go back to uh, uh, the second H one B lottery video, I continue. That's where I originally said I expected the second H one B lottery to happen sometime between um, July twenty sixth and and August thirteenth. And uh, looks like USCIS moved up the the selection date uh, by a couple of weeks this year. Um, giving employers until November 3rd to submit their, their paper petitions. So um, wanted to just kind of close that up, close that loop up here during the live stream, but I've got some awesome data. Um, I think it's really interesting data to, to share with you here today. Um, but just wanted to mention, if you have any questions or comments, leave those in the chat. Um, I'll get to those at the end after I cover the data on the H-1B survey and, and talk about some of the comments uh, uh, so impacting um, the travel ban that's that's still currently ongoing. Uh, so feel free to put your questions or comments um, in the chat. Of course, if you're looking for ways to support the H-1B Guy platform here on YouTube, you can do so through uh, the live chat um, uh, feature here. <clears throat> And you can also do so through buymeacoffee.com slash the H1B guy. Um, so, you know, feel free, uh, Super Chats or, um, or buy me a coffee if you want to support the platform here today during this live stream. Uh, any of the contributions made here to the H1B guy um, are reinvested back into the technology of this platform, uh, working on some more improvements and uh, really just appreciate all of your support. So again, if you've got questions or comments, I'll get to those at the end. But I wanted to first cover um, some data that was provided to me. Um, those of you who may remember, uh, during a couple of live streams, uh, one back on March the 12th, um, then again in, in, in mid-June, 
um, where I, excuse me, May the 12th, where I talked about uh, Dr. Nina Gopalan from the University of Redlands. Uh, I shared this multiple times on Twitter, and I know a lot of you participated uh, in this survey. Um, Dr. Nina was, was so kind to share um, some of the preliminary results uh, surrounding the H-1B survey. Uh, so I wanted to, to cover some of the data here. I thought it may be of interest to some of you, um, either now or, or into the future, as, as we talk about the state of affairs and the mental mindset of the H-1B employee currently living and working in the U.S. So just starting out with uh, with some of the data that I think is, is most interesting, um, 36% of the respondents, uh, ages range between 25 to 35, 55% between 36 to 45, um, and then a little over 8% between 46 uh, to 55. The other thing I found really interesting was the current citizenship. Uh, so of course, you know, 90% of, of the respondents were of Indian descent, but the thing that stood out to me most. The second most responsive um, country of origin was from Azerbaijan, and it came in at a little over 5%. I, I would have never guessed that, but I will tell you, my analytics tell me um, that my website and this YouTube channel are viewed by individuals from Azerbaijan. So very clearly, there is an H-1B pipeline um, that's been established uh, through Azerbaijan. Uh, how many years have they been living in the U.S.? And I thought that this was was very interesting. So just a little over 2% from one to three years. From four to 10 years, that number was 47%. From 11 to 15 years, that number was just a little over 41%. And then 15 years or more was 9%. So by far the, the, the largest uh, category here, living in the U.S., between four to 10 years was, was 47%. So moving on to a higher education, uh, advanced U.S. degree or higher, so that's master's, uh, six-year, as well as PhD candidates, uh, 52, a little over 52% of the respondents um, were educated here in the U.S., and then moving on to educational qualifications, and I thought this was really interesting. 26% of the respondents, bachelor's degree, 65% master's degree, and 9% doctor's degree. So by far the largest category of educational qualifications for H-1B holders who responded back to this survey was 65% with a master's degree. So the next question I think that would be of interest to a lot of you is how long have you been working um, on H-1B here in the U.S.? Uh, 8% between one to three years. Uh, between four to 10 years, again, very large uh, uh, percentage of the respondents, uh, 57%. Between 11 to 15 years, 31, almost 32%. Uh, between 16 to 20 years, just a little over 2%. Uh, so I thought that that was, was also really telling where the largest, again, kind of mirroring, if you go back and look at how long they've been in the U.S., how long they've been working on H-1B, um, you know, 57%, 4 to 10 years, uh, whereas in the U.S., that number was 47% um, from on the 4 to, four to 10 years. So, we always talk about workload, um, you know, the average work week here in the U.S. average, I use that term very loosely, 40 hours per week. 37% uh, said 40 hours per week. 46% said 40 to 50 hours per week. 13% um, 50 to 60 hours per week. And, and a little over 2% said 60 to 70 hours per week. Um, so I thought that that was also very interesting. You look at very heavy workloads and, and I would assume we've seen, um, you know, those, those numbers expand greatly as, as remote has become more of the norm. Um, have you thought about leaving your current job? 17% uh, gave a maybe, 26% uh, said probably yes. And then 24% uh, said definitely Yes. Um, 
The next question that I thought was very interesting. Would you have left your current job if you did not have to change your H-1B to a new employer? 86% said yes, and 14% said no. So that's a pretty staggering statistic there. Uh, if you think about it, rating their overall job satisfaction, 11% um, said very low, 17% said low, 40% said neither high nor low, 27% uh, said high, and then 3% with, with a very high. Um, so I thought that that was also uh, really interesting. Um, and one of the things we talk about a lot here on this channel, of course, is the green card backlog and, and how that has been created and, and really what the, uh, the root cause is of that issue. So here's some, some statistics that I think really uh, dive into that a little bit further. Um, and it, it says, how long have you been waiting for your green card if your I-140 has been approved? 34% between one to five years. 41% between six to 10 years, 6% said I've applied but haven't received my approved I-140, um, and then 4% said submitted my 485 but still waiting for change of status. Uh, that was 4%. Um, so again, I, I thought that that was uh, another interesting statistic. I mean, you look at 41% of the respondents here on this survey uh, have been waiting between six to 10 years, okay? And then an additional almost 14%, but 13.7%, but if you will, over 10 years. And, and we've talked about those calculations and waiting over you know 3,600 plus days for their final action adjustment of status to, to come current. Um, so I thought that that this was was some really interesting data that was put out there. Um, you know, the 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 last question was in um, respect to U.S. culture and how what aspect of of the culture here in the United States is most appealing. Um, there was a variety of answers, but I think the most common answer for me. Um, when we look at, at some of the, the, the groupings here is the freedom and the diversity. And so I think that that's very interesting when, when you look at that and, and what that means. Uh, we've talked about this a lot. Um, opportunity being a very big part of the reason why high-skilled immigrants want to come to the U.S. Uh, but I wanted to say thanks to Dr. Nina Gopalan for sharing um, you know, these statistics with me. Uh, I thought it was uh, was was some very telling information, some very telling numbers um, here, and and look for more from me on this as in the future as this goes into publication. I'll be able to share uh, a lot more into the data and the analytics around it. Um, just wanted to ask you again if you haven't already, please subscribe to the H one B Guy channel here on YouTube. Uh, like this video um, so that it can help pr be promoted in the YouTube algorithm, uh, and if you haven't as well, make sure you click the bell for notifications uh, so that you're notified anytime we go live like I have here today on August the 4th that at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, so you don't miss any of these live streams. Just love the, the community that jumps in here with, with the q and I, I do see some questions already. I will get to those. Um, there's a little bit more information that I want to cover on the impact of the travel ban, some of the results, uh, continuation of the questions from the survey. Um, but like this video, subscribe to the H1B Guy channel. If you have questions or comments, post those in the chat. I'll be sure to get to those um, at the end of the, the session here. I wanted to move on to talk about the travel ban. And, you know, when the, the extension or the new travel ban uh, was put in place by, by President Biden, um, one of the things that I started talking about many months ago, if you go back and, and look at when the outbreak uh, and the crisis, you know, really escalated uh, in in India, uh, and and the ban was put in place even on non-immigrant, um, you know, high skilled H one B specifically. Uh, I, I said that you know, really, this is where you have to make a very tough decision, and that decision is: Do you want to risk um, your ability to get back into the country? Um, during this ban to, to be with either, you know, a sick parent, a sick family member, whatever the case may be, and that 
Um, it was a really difficult decision for, for thousands of high school immigrants to have to make, um, you know, leaving behind their assets and, and their life here for the possibility of not being able to get back in. And one of the things I talked about was planning on getting back in sometime in early mid 2022. And so here we are, you know, the, the first week of August, um, we're, we're beginning to see the, the outbreak of, of the Delta variant um, here in the United States. Uh, specifically Florida, Louisiana, Missouri, uh, very big hotspots for the, the, the Delta variant outbreaks. Um, and so I, I think, you know, one of the big pushes here that we've seen in staff augmentation uh, over the last several months has been businesses with this desire to return back to on-site work, even if that's in some sort of hybrid two or three days in the office a week. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see as mass mandates start to make their way back into um, interior offices, uh, local counties and municipalities mandating those. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how how these enterprise organizations and startups handle it. Um, I saw recently, uh, I think it was yesterday or maybe even this morning, uh, that, that the LinkedIn CEO announced that it, they would that the entire workforce for LinkedIn would remain fully remote into the foreseeable future, uh, maybe even indefinitely. Uh, so I think these all things play a part in the recruitment strategy and how we go about uh, uh, filling needs. Uh, I really believe that in the next several months, we're going to begin to see, um, you know, th these shortages continue. Uh, because if you think about a lot of the international 2020 H-1B visas that haven't been able to enter into the U.S., many of you have reached out to me asking me, you know, how do I go about it? Do you think I'd qualify for a uh, natural interest exception? Um, you know, those those are still a lot of to be determined. And I think the biggest thing that you're going to see as I read some of these comments um, is that the uncertainty and in being able to obtain a consulate appointment um, in India at any of the U.S. consulates throughout the country has been one of the biggest uh, deterrents for individuals traveling. Add, add that to the travel ban. Um, and so I, I think that, that these are some very real raw and, and emotional comments that I'm going to share with you. Uh, but it just goes to show you this impact that COVID's had, the travel ban and how it's had, and, and kind of the double standard that was put in place for non-immigrant high school um, individuals that are living and working in this country on H-1B visa, um, whose I-94s, passport stamps, maybe have expired and, and not able to uh, to obtain a consulate appointment, um, being one of the the, the largest um, you know factors in in the lack of travel. So I'm just going to read some of these these comments here to you, and and again uh, these these are comments that were obtained through the survey. Um, through my friend, Dr. Nina Gopalan from the University of Redlands in, in California. Um, so the first one says, my father-in-law passed away on April 27th and my mother-in-law is in ICU. My husband went to take care of her and for the last rites. Now he's stuck in India. Another one says, my father passed away in November 2020. I have a newborn baby who my father has not seen in person. I could not travel because of COVID as well and due to huge delays at U.S. consulates. I was worried I'd be stuck in India for visa stamping and lose my job in the U.S. if I can't return in a reasonable time. I haven't traveled to my home country or met family for the last six years. I was worried about getting a visa refused there. My brother got married and had a kid and I've never met them. I wanted to go this time, but travel ban has affected me and there's no way I can go and come back due to long green card backlog for Indians. I'm not able to pursue my dreams or move affiliate from jobs. I've already spent a good part of my youth here and can't re relocate now. This feels like a never ending modern day slavery to me. And we've heard that comment a lot, uh, the indentured servitude analogy. Um, in reference to living in, and working in the U.S. on, on H-1B visa. It's been a very common theme. Um, here's another one. It's been more than four years since I visited my home country and met my parents. The travel ban, nearly impossible for getting U.S. consulate appointment for visa stamping, etc., has really affected me mentally and my work-life balance. I hope U.S. will allow us to do stamping without existing, uh, exiting the country so that next time we can travel to India without worrying about stamping and avoid long leave, which may affect the job and my kids' education. Here's another one. Because of the travel ban, we have to live in fear of not being able to travel when my family in, in India needs us to be there. 
few of my colleagues on H1B didn't travel to India to do final rights to their parents, and it's really heartbreaking. Uh, I think that this is the biggest story around, you know, the the outbreak that happened in India, and um, honestly, the the lack of options and um, helplessness. You know, the the helpless feeling of not being able to to administer last, last rites rituals. Um, to deceased parents, not being able to be with other loved ones during this time of mourning. Here's another one. Yes, I've not been able to visit my family since December 2019. Very unhappy because I don't have any family members here in the U.S. and it's pretty lonely. I also feel the pressure of being the cause of pain on my family members since they don't fully understand why we can't see each other. And here's another one. I've not been able to visit my family back in India for five years due to multiple visa issues. Currently, both me and my wife are stuck in the U.S., even though family members have been affected by COVID. I mean, I literally could could read hundreds of these comments. It's been four years and I haven't been to India. I was planning to go in June, made preparations for visa staffing. But travel and travel ban have uh, been placed and canceling my plans to, to do so. The travel ban has been extremely stressful. I lost my dear aunt recently and I couldn't go see her one last time as I would be stuck in India without a visa stamping and my family being in the U.S. I mean, the thing is about this is that these stories literally just go on and on and on. And... You know, we, we've talked about a lot of different things here on this channel, and, and I, I'll be honest, I, I as it relates to travel bans and outbreaks, internationally speaking, um, we've been been pretty transparent as a country on how we've we've handled that. But the thing with the India travel ban to me that that is unique is is the the discriminatory discriminatory nature of it, meaning that it allows travel for some, but excludes travel for others. And, you know, there are organizations out there and individuals out there now that are profiting off of this. And what I mean by that is that there are organizations that are uh, setting up apartments in Mexico and Doha and Dubai and Belgrade, Serbia, that are assisting in high school immigrants and they're quarantining over a 14 day period so that they could go from India into one of these uh, country cities and then enter into the U S and it's, it, the question is, is why, you know, if, if we're going to allow an Indian national has been quarantining in, in, in Doha or Mexico city or Belgrade or, or, um, you know, Abu Dhabi to, 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 to enter, um, or even Dubai uh, to enter, then I have a hard time. And I, and I think that that's where like the line is drawn as we're talking about division of families, uh, kids, parents, and then, you know, the, the assets component, right? Mortgages, car payments, um, and everything that, that goes into that, I, I think is something for me is, is very personal. Um, and you look at these stories and, and like I said, there's literally probably when I look at these, um, <laughs> there are hundreds of responses. Um, here's another one. I've been impacted mainly due to the huge backlog for GC due to per country cap. Been waiting for GC for more than 10 years. It's hard to travel back to India due to visa restrictions. Um, we were in India due to my father's passing in April when the ban got announced. Luckily we got exempted and then could travel though. We spent at least $10,000 in booking flights due to last minute flight cancellation from the airlines. We originally planned to fly due to the travel ban. I mean, these are the things that, you know, as a high school immigrant that, that you deal with, um, you know, the travel ban caused me not to see my parents for a long time. I had to cancel their tickets after the ban and I cannot go visit them because one, I need an H-1B stamping. Two, cannot enter the U.S. even with a stamp during the ban. My parents are aging and not being able to be with them while pursuing a career here has brought sadness to the day-to-day -day life here and for my family back home. I mean, the, the thing that, that again resonates with me and when you look at, at the questions over and over and the comments over and over as it relates to the continuation of the ban, um, it, 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 it's very real. Um, it's touched a lot of lives. Um, a lot of you who uh, follow the H1B Guy platform, 
um, have been impacted indirectly and directly. You've lost parents, you've lost aunts, you've lost uncles, you've lost grandparents. Um, and, and I think that that's the thing about this pandemic that has created a lot of questions um, is it, it knows no boundaries and, and who it's impacted. And so, you know, appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity here today to, to share some of this H-1B survey data. Um, what did you guys find interesting about the data? Is there anything that stood out to you in some of the data that, that I shared um, that either surprised you or, or that you agreed with? Uh, what about the comments surrounding the travel ban? Is it, um, is that something that, that resonates with, with, with you out there? Uh, do, do you, do you relate to some of these comments? Have, have some of you, has it been six, four, five, six years since, since you've been able to go home and, and see your family, extended family? Um, you know, I can't imagine personally not being able to, uh, to go back to, to the hometown where I grew up in, although it's, it's been a while since I've been there. Um, you know, ultimately I, I have the freedom to go do so. Uh, I, I can't imagine, you know, as a high school immigrant in another country, not being able to do that, uh, what, what that's like. So, um, just wanted to ask you again, please like this video, subscribe to the H1B guy channel here on YouTube, uh, and click the bell for notifications so that you're notified anytime, uh, we go live like I have here today, or I post new content here to this channel. Um, also wanted to let you know if you're looking for ways to support the H1B Guy platform, you can do so now through this live stream and the super chat function. Um, you can also do so through buymeacoffee.com slash the H1B Guy if you enjoy the content that I produce. Um, any contributions to the platform are reinvested back into the technology uh, that goes into producing uh, the content that I put out here on the H1B Guy channel on YouTube and on the H1BGuy.com. Uh, just wanted to say thank you for all of your support in the month of July. It was a record month here on the YouTube channel as well as a record month on the website. So thank you for allowing me to be your trusted source for all things uh, H1B. Um, really just appreciate that opportunity to, to be a trusted voice in this community. Uh, thanks for all of your support. Um, I can't do this without you guys. I say it all the time, but I really appreciate it. It really means a lot and, and I just can't do this without you. So if you have questions or comments, I've only got a handful here. I will go through those. Um, I'll answer those and any others that, uh, that come in. Hey, Vijaya, how are you? Nice to see you. Uh, let's see. Any chances of a third lottery that was asked by uh, Imra Khan? And then Vijaya asked the same question. Is there any third H-1B lottery possibility? Uh, you know, that's a great question. I, I hadn't really thought about that being a possibility. Um, I actually got asked this question, I think on Twitter and I don't know if I've responded back. So if I haven't responded back to you on Twitter, I apologize. Uh, I don't believe that we'll see a third lottery, but I will say that I went on record, um, back in March, April, and I didn't believe that there would be a second H-1B lottery at that time either. And I was basing that on the analytics of 308,000 applicants for the 85,000 spots. But I think as we've seen and, and what's the electronic filing is, has created is, is kind of the scenario where a lot of employers are flooding the system. Um, a lot of H-1B applicants are allowing multiple employers to put them in the electronic portal. Why? Because the risk is minimal for them. And if they're selected, then they get to choose uh, who they will allow to submit that paper petition for them. So my point in sharing that is that I, I think, and I said this last week uh, during the H-1B Guy News, which is I think the second lottery for each fiscal year now with H-1B, um, with this electronic filing selection process for H-1B, I think a second lottery is going to be a new norm. And I think historically speaking now, year over year, we're going to start to see USCIS at the beginning of March, open the electronic portal, close it 21 days later, make notifications by the end of March so that beginning on April 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, whatever that first Monday in April is, open the paper petition submission period there, move that 90 days forward, and then at the end of that 90-day period, get an idea of how many applicants they have in process, 
how many are available. And then mid, mid end of July, they'll do a second selection based on existing applicants. One of the things that came up last week we talked about, and, and I, I did get some verification on it, is it was it is possible for uh, individuals who were selected in the first round to be selected again in the second round if their petition was not fully submitted. Um, so I have heard reports of cases where that was the case. Um, I don't have exact numbers on the number that was issued. Um, I've been assuming that it was probably around 15,000. Uh, so that would put the, the total number for fiscal year uh, 2022, but at around 100,000 um, H-1Bs that were selected and notified of being selected, uh, but that doesn't account for the number of paper petitions and approvals that happen. Vijay also asks, uh, next H-1B for fiscal year uh, 2023 will be based on wage level. Um, so that's a great question. I, I think that uh, if you watch the H-1B Guy News, uh, for the weekend in July 30th, I, I talked about this a little bit, which is the Biden administration uh, continues to fight the lawsuit as it relates to uh, wage-based selection for H-1B lottery. Uh, so what that tells me is that they're most likely going to use the, 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 the Trump final rule, the Trump administration final rule that was architected by Stephen Miller, um, to, to be the blueprint for their wage-based selection for the H-1B lottery electronic uh, selection process in, in fiscal year 2023. Uh, one of the things I, I've been saying since the end of last year, and I, I covered it in my seven predictions uh, for 2021, and, and I've talked about this a good bit throughout the year, I still believe that we'll see some kind of hybrid solution I could be wrong in this, but I still believe that what we'll see is wage-based selection um, that assigns a certain percentage to the various wage levels. And so what I mean by that is if it's a level one H-1B uh, petition that's submitted, uh, the highest wage in a specific MSA for that wage level is then who's going to be awarded. And you kind of work your way up level two, same, same concept, level three and level four. So we go one, two, three, four. So basically they could take 25% um, and assign 25% to each of the wage levels and then differentiate that based on um, the, the metropolitan statistical area and those that, that have the highest wage based um, our compensation salary that that's that's being offered, and I think what that does is it will it will it will put an end to the lawsuit that's out there that says it's discriminatory for level ones and individuals out of uh, recent grads that can't compete because their their compensation is at a much lower number than somebody who maybe has many years of experience and is is commanding top dollar. Of course. Those of you can go back and look. I've been a proponent of wage-based selection. Um, I believe it it ends a lot of disputes around the way the H one B lottery right now currently works. Uh, personally, I think what it does is it it ends the cheap labor debate, um, and it it also is is awarding companies who are willing to pay um, talent top dollar. And what I mean by that is that right now, you know, companies. And, and I've covered this in, in 2020, fiscal year 2020, it was a 30, 31% probability, uh, fiscal year 2022, 27% probability. So it, companies are looking to increase their odds on obtaining H-1B visas. And I talk about this all the time as well. The value of the H-1B visa has never been higher. Again, we see continued proof of that when, you know, you guys are asking me about the possibility of a third lottery. Uh, it, it just shows how valuable it is, not only for the individual, uh, but for the employer. Thanks, Vijaya, for the question. Really appreciate that. Hey, Hema, is that second lottery selected persons? We're all notified. Can I still expect attorneys to answer? I'm from Texas. Well, hello from Texas. I'll tell you, it has been super hot here in Atlanta um, over the last week. I can only imagine uh, Texas is probably feeling some of that same heat and humidity. Um, I will admit that uh, I'm looking forward to some cooler temperatures, but it's still two months away here in, in the deep south. Um, yes, I, I think that if you were selected, your attorney or your employer would have already been notified, Hema. Um, unfortunately, if you weren't selected, um, you know, it will it will take a while for that to, to, to show. Uh, if you recall, it was early February um, of this year. 
of 2021 when USCIS announced that the fiscal uh, lottery for 2020, HOV fiscal lottery for 2020 had been completed. Um, so uh, again, uh, I think that, um, you know, that there's, there's still a lot of moving parts and we're still getting some more insight as to what this process looks like for the electronic selection. Uh, it really has changed the game, right? Because at a very low cost, employers can have their attorneys or on their own accord, um, submit potential H-1B beneficiaries um, into a portal without having to prepare a full petition and the legal and filing fees. So I think what that's created is a lot of employers now putting in individual names into the portal without actual jobs. And so I'm really interested to see. I haven't seen the data for uh, Q3 yet, uh, but I'd, I'd love to see the Q3 data that, that starts in April, May, and June and covers the new H-1B approval percentages. Um, I always turn to, uh, uh, to, to the NFAP on that data. They do a great job of mining that data and, and presenting that in a, a very understandable format. Uh, so once they put something out on that, I'll, I'll be sure to cover it. Uh, so thanks, Emma. Nice to, to see you. Thanks for, for joining me here today. Um, just wanted to ask you again, if you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the H1B Guy channel here on YouTube, and be sure to click the bell for notifications um, so that you're notified anytime we go live like I have here this afternoon. If you're looking for ways to support the H1B Guy channel and the H1B Guy platform, you can do so uh, right now uh, through this live stream, through the super chat function, or if you're catching us at a later time, uh, you can do so through uh, buymeacoffee.com slash the H1B Guy, um, or there are uh, other ways to contribute in the video description um, here of this live stream. Hey, Prakash, nice to see you, my friend. How are you? Uh, any hope for EB2 2013 people at all? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, a few weeks ago, uh, before the August bulletin posted, uh, I put out a video that, uh, that was put out on July 12th, and I had worked on that a little bit the, the previous week. That was a look ahead to the October 2020 visa bullets. And a lot of you had been asking me for it. And so, you know, I went ahead and, and, and produced that video. And precaution, that video, I said, I think final action dates will reach June 1st, 2012, and that dates of filing would reach June 1st, 2013. Um, so again, depending on where you fall, there could be a possibility if I'm right, which is a big if I've been hitting at about 30 plus percent on these predictions on my monthly visa bulletin predictions, uh, because we've seen a lot of aggressive movement and then we've seen lack of movement and aggressive movement and lack of movement. Uh, but I'll still hold fast to, to what I said, uh, which was a, a little under a month ago. Um, and until I see that September bulletin, I, I still believe that we're going to see some good movement for India EB2. Uh, I think that that will get to June 1st, 2012. But um, and then dates of filing, as I said, June 1st, 2013. If you're curious about India EB3, I've, I've moved that up now. Um, you know, my uh, my prediction for the September bulletin, I went ahead and said, uh, January 1st, 2014, which of course is nothing new. That's something that Charlie Oppenheim has been talking about uh, quite a while. But when I put out the look ahead video, it, it just seemed like to me EB3 wasn't tracking um, as much as we were being led to believe. But we saw 180 plus days forward movement for the August bolt. And, and I fully expect, uh, I think it was 184 days that, that I predicted for the September bulletin. Uh, I still believe that we have uh, a probability of getting dates of filing for India EB3 into 2015. Um, on the look ahead, I said June 1st, 2015. But I could see a, a, a real scenario where it's just January 1st, 2015. Um, so uh, again, there's a lot of assumptions being made. One of the things about, about these bulletins and these predictions, and, and I say this in my disclaimer when I put them out, is my, my forecast, my predictions, everything that I talk about are just completely made up dates based on my own personal hunch and historical data. And 
watching Charlie Oppenheim chats with Charlie month over month. Right. But I, I don't really read into it much more than that. Um, I, I do try to look at some of the analytics around it. Some of the adjustment of status processing numbers, um, which, you know, I still feel like we're going to see some good forward movement coming up in, in the October bulletin, but it's going to be interesting to see uh, what does happen. So thanks, Prakash, for your question. I appreciate you uh, you joining me here this afternoon. Hey, Chetan, nice to see you, my friend. Hope you're doing well. Uh, thanks so much for uh, for joining in here this afternoon. I think I missed you right at the end of the live stream last week. So uh, nice to see you popping in here today. Hey, Robert, any idea of wage-based lottery for next fiscal year? Yeah, that was, um, you know, I think what, what I addressed earlier to Vijaya's question uh, if you look at the lawsuit um, that you know U.S. government responded back to, um, you know there were there were three points that uh, that they made um, in that lawsuit that I covered last week on on the H one B Guy News for the week ending July thirtieth, and you know ultimately it's they argued that the rule was properly issued by a duly authorized official that the argument that the rule comports with immigration law and that the course, the third point was that the course of rulemaking at issue here is that DHS adequately responded to all significant comments. And so, listen, I mean, if you look at Je Judge Jeffrey uh, S. White has, has been a big proponent of high-skilled immigrants in these cases. Uh, he's ruled very favorably in, in most of these cases. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, if, if you want, want to take my stance on it, I still am going to hold tight to this. I said this at the end of last year. I still think that wage-based uh, selection is, is on the table and is highly uh, probable. Uh, I feel like, though, and, and this is just my personal gut, I feel like this administration – has the potential to be more reasonable here and rewrite this rule that will award percentages to a variety of the wage levels, meaning there are four different wage levels, uh, level one, 25% of the allotment, level two, 25% of the allotment, level three, 25% of the allotment, level four, 25% of the allotment. And that in that allotment, there'll be a uh, wage-based selection that will go to the highest wage for each individual MSA as it relates to the percentages. So I call it kind of a hybrid wage-based selection. But what this lawsuit that, that happened you know, last week tells me is that um, the Biden administration has until the end of the year uh, to roll this out. And it still looks to me more and more like this is going to be highly probable. So thank you so much, Chetan. And Man, thank you so much for the super chat, man. I really appreciate it. Um, the growth that's been going on here on this channel over the last few weeks is has been um, really humbling. And and I will tell you that a lot of it, I, I can't do it without you. Guys like you chatting that, that join in here on these live streams and engage and, and that help support me in the ways that you have over the many months. I just really appreciate it. Uh, and, it, and honestly, it's it's what allowed me to continue to to do what I love, which is, um, you know, help employers and individuals solve complex work authorization issues and the recruitment process, but also bring awareness to employment based immigration benefits, uh, as we've covered here today in the H1B data survey and a lot of the comments as it relates to the impact of the travel ban. So thank you so much, man, for your continued support. Hey, Harini, how are you? Um, when to expect EB2 December 2013 date of filing and final action date? You know, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, again, I, I think right now, if I look ahead to October, I think a December 1st, 2013 final action date is in play for India EB3. If we're talking about India EB2, I think a date of filing for that uh, for June 1st, 2013 is in play, but that doesn't get you to December. Uh, so it's about six months behind. Um, so if you want to, to really peel into it and look into it, um, I think you're probably looking into fiscal year 2023 at this point. 
Uh, I know that that can sound like a pretty harsh reality, uh, but I will tell you, it just seems to be that the way these things are tracking. One thing that could help you in EB2, though, is the amount of downgrades that we know have happened going back to October 2020. Uh, so I think, Harini, that could be a boost for you. Um, again, if you're asking me to say, hey, where do I think this is going to be? I think you're still looking at, I, I'm going to put, if you want to range on it, I'm going to say 18 months from October before final action, um, or excuse me, before dates of filing would, would be current um, for this EB2 December 2013. Um, but when you talk about final action, I, I think, again, you've got to add, as Charlie talked about in episode five, six to 12 months from when that date of filing is mentioned is when that final action uh, date would be current. Um, so uh, you're close, but you still got several months ahead of you. Uh, you know, you're probably thinking about downgrading. A lot of you who've read the comments and heard me talk about this know I'm not a fan of the downgrade. I think it diminishes the experience that you've earned. I think from an employer perspective, it tells me that I, I could have probably hired a lesser resource. It possibly for me could open questions to a certifying officer. Um, but there's a lot out there of the opinion with you in this situation uh, that you most likely could, if you could file your downgrade, you could get your downgrade filed and 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 get that I-140 filed. Um, you know, you could potentially do so in, in the next 12 to 18 months. Then, you know, your your dates are current. So that's that's the that's the question. You're kind of in that that weird gap. I think anyone that's in that that very late 2012. Uh, to, to early 2015 is in a very weird gap and in, in trying to figure out, do I downgrade? Do I not? Is my employer willing to downgrade? Is my employer not willing to downgrade? And how do I go about that? So thanks for the question, Harini. Nice to see you. Hema, no problem. Um, happy to help you. Really appreciate uh, your support here. Um, just wanted to, to let everyone know if you have any questions or comments, going to be wrapping up here in a few minutes. Um, if there's anything that, that we've covered here today that uh, that might be of interest to you um, that you want to comment on or a question that you may have, I have a couple of more minutes uh, that, that I wanted to um, to just discuss here. I, I, again, if, if you missed it earlier, um, you know, some of the things that I found really interesting from the H-1B data survey uh, is that over 90% of the respondents were Indian nationals, 5%, which was the second largest, Azerbaijan, not one response from a Chinese national. Um, and as we know, 18 to 20% of all H-1B visas go to Chinese nationals. So very interesting to see them not participate in this survey at all. Uh, over 47% have been living in the U.S. four to 10 years. Uh, 41, almost 42% between 11 to 15 years. Uh, and then the education, as I mentioned, you know, 52% um, completed a master's six year or a, a PhD degree here in the US. And that 65, 64.7, uh, 65% um, of all individuals that responded back to this H1B survey are master's degree, um, and then 9% with, with PhDs. Um, and then of course, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit, uh, at, towards the end going over the data, but 41% of respondents have been waiting, um, for their I-140 or that has their I-140 approved have been waiting for their, their adjustment of status, their final action date to come current. 41% have been waiting six to 10 years and almost 14% have been waiting uh, over 10 years. So I think that those are just some very telling uh, and real statistics that, that give a lot of insight into um, you know, the H-1B life here in the U.S. and, and what that's like. Um, I also, so I, I'm not sure, I may have missed, there was one more uh, statistic that I thought was really interesting. Um, let me find it. It talked about, w would you, would you, knowing what you know, um, you know, would, would you, would you do it again? And, you know, I, I think that the interesting thing about that answer was it was 
it was pretty low uh, in, in terms of the overall satisfaction um, and what the quality of life was was like here. It was, uh, it was very interesting um, to see. It says, if you reflect on your experiences that you've gained on an H-1B visa in your life in the U.S., would you do these all over again if given a chance? 42% said definitely no. 25% said probably not. 13% said maybe. 12% said probably yes. And 7% said definitely yes. So 42% of respondents um, who participated in this H-1B survey said, given what they know now, having lived this experience, they would not do it again. And I think that that is a very telling statistic. And ultimately, I've talked about this a lot, that H-1B visas are a big part of job growth here in the U.S. For every H-1B visa that American employers uh, employ, it creates two American jobs. I've talked about those statistics a lot. Um, and, and you see here that 42% say that they wouldn't do it again. And I think that that's going to be a very telling sign for future generations. It'll have an impact because word of mouth will get out from these 42% on what their experience was like. Um, hey, Sue, how are you? Hello, Robert. Do I know when the September bulletin will be out? Yeah, so on Monday, I put out my H-1B guy forecast, uh, the September 2021 uh, visa bulletin employment based predictions. And for those of you who had, had a chance to watch that video at the very end, I always do a prediction of when the bulletin will be released. Um, I've been over by a week the last couple of weeks. Uh, looking at August, it's kind of a funny week where things end up falling. And so I really think that I went back, I said, my, my, my number one guess is Wednesday, August 18th, um, and then Tuesday, August 17th, and Thursday, August 19th. So I think in that week, really, those three days will be when we've seen it. The last couple of months, we've seen it in the second, third week of the month on a Wednesday specifically. Um, so it just is one of those where... Um, you know, we continue to see uh, them putting out the bulletin in advance, which has been a big change from the previous administration when it was a lot of wait till the end of the month with very few days. Um, so it's good to see that, that they're getting these out earlier in the month. You know, if, if you recall, um, it was either episode or episode, episode one or episode two of Chats with Charlie, where he talks about they have a meeting on the 8th of every month, typically, um, that finalizes the dates. And so, you know, I've always kind of gone by that. And, and we've just seen him looks like very certain of the dates and, and pushing those out earlier. Hey, Wally, appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. I um, When I get comments like this, I can't tell you how excited they make me. What it tells me is that... Uh, um, I'm a trusted and respected voice here in this community and ultimately, you know, looking to help bring clarity around a lot of these issues, um, transparency and, and help educate, because I think it's one of these things where not a lot of people um, understand how the H-1B visa works, how it operates and, and a lot of the costs that are associated into it. And then look at statistics around that H-1B visa survey where 42% said they definitely would not come back here again on an H-1B visa. That's a pretty staggering statistic. I'll tell you that. So, Sue, absolutely. Thanks for jumping in here today. Really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. So um, just wanted to put out one last call for any questions or comments. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and do uh, the, the closing out copy read here. But if any come in uh, after that, I'll be sure to address them before uh, signing off. So I just wanted to remind everyone that today's live stream is brought to you by RecruiterNetworks.com, the smart solution for digital perm ads and local job postings since 2001. This national job board network provides recruitment websites in 1,024 major U.S. metro areas, and each local job board is its own portal as a low-cost re resource for immigration recruitment ads and local job postings for all industries and professions with a flat price of $225 per ad or $1,000 per month regardless of which city you choose. RecruiterNetworks.com, 
tell them the H1B guy sent you. You know, my good friend Richard Allman um, is is great at what he does, and he provides a very low cost resource for local recruitment. And it works for local jobs and uh, immigration recruitment as it have to happen in local markets. So tell my friend Richard that I sent you and he will be sure to take great care of you. I promise you that. So live stream is also brought to you by Path to Canada. Path to Canada provides an ideal plan B for high skilled immigrants currently located in the U.S. whose status may be uncertain. If you're facing an H-1B denial or OPT expiration, don't get caught off guard. Make sure you have a plan B and Path to Canada is your answer. They will gladly help you navigate the process. And if you're interested in finding out more, please be sure to use the link in the video description below. You've heard me talk about my good friend Mark Palava Palouse a lot. Uh, of course, I had him on and I had Richard on as well um, for the H-1B Guy Presents. Uh, but look for more from Path to Canada and as well as Syndesis and myself, the H-1B Guy, going forward. There's some things that we've been working on over the last few weeks. Um, and I'll be announcing those in, in the upcoming weeks. But just be on the lookout for more from there. I, I can't tell you enough um, about how much I trust the process and what Path to Canada does and the services that Syndesis provides. Uh, so if I can create an introduction for you and, and my friend Mark, please reach out to me, let me know. Uh, and this stream is also brought to you by perm-ads.com, the industry leader in providing a seamless experience for employers and immigration attorneys navigating the complex perm recruitment ad phase of the labor certification process. If you want to reduce your costs and overhead associated with the perm labor certification recruitment advertising, let perm-ads.com help you. I can tell you this, that perm labor recruitment advertising is expensive. And one of the things that perm-ads.com does is help you reduce those costs and overhead associated with it. My good friend Carl Balsmeyer is the best of the best in this space. And if I can help create an introduction for you and Carl and perm-ads.com, please let me know. Um, I will tell you that, uh, that I love their platform. Their customer service is literally second to none. Um, so, and one last question come in is just from Sue and it said, hey, can we ask Charlie's uh, State Department what would be the data filing for EB2 in October bulletin? Um, that way people in 2012, 13 who can be benefited with straight filing can avoid the downgrade. Yeah, I think that'd be a question. I, I may um, post that in the pre where they, they have that inbox that's posted on the visa bulletin where you can send that in, Sue. And then they also um, will take you know questions during the live stream. Uh, one of the things they did say is that please avoid the spamming if at all possible. So I would advise you to make your question uh, unique. Um, so thanks for jumping in with that last question, Sue. Really appreciate it. I just wanted to say thank you for everyone who took time to uh, join the live stream and, and post questions. Vijaya, uh, Imrakan, um, Hema, Prakash, my good friend Chetan, thank you. Thank you for the super chat, Chetan. I just really appreciate it so much. Um, Harini and uh, Sue and, and Wally, thank you guys for your questions and your comments and all of your support. Thanks to everyone who, who joined in here on the live stream. Uh, I'm Robert. I'm the H-1B guy, your global source for all things H-1B.